All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. It's a real pleasure to have another one of our um, very popular and uh, very uh, useful, you know, it's really exciting webinars that we've been having um, every two weeks or so. Uh, the IFES GEDC community along with IUCE, it's a global webinar. And uh, and once again, you know, it's, uh, it's a topic that's uh, very, very relevant and exciting and important, very, very important. It's a multidisciplinary approach to developing sustainable communities. I have with my, with my with me my very good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Sirin Tekinai, and uh, technology that prevents her from uh, from showing her face to us, but uh, uh, she is a very close colleague of our speaker, so I want to give her the honor uh, so to, to introduce our speaker. But Sirin Tekinai is, is the chair of the Global Engineering Dean's Council, and so uh, my pleasure to invite you, Sirin, to uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, Krishna. It's such a pleasure to be here, and it is an honor indeed to introduce our speaker today, uh, because Dr. Moavier Raidaide was um, the CEO of uh, an SE of Nexus, uh, a, a planning um, organization of social, environmental, economic, sustainability solutions. When I met him, during my deanship at the American University of Sharjah uh, up until uh, February, that's a post I held. And um, uh, his company under his leadership provided services to the sustainable cities in Dubai and Sharjah. And of course, the Dubai sustainable city, if uh, anyone's interested in sustainability at all on this planet, is a beacon of uh, exemplary achievements. And the same is happening in Sharjah. So it's uh, been a pleasure uh, to, to work with Dr. Adaide. It's wonderful to have him with us. Um, before uh, his uh, life as a CEO, uh, if we can go back to his background a little bit, he has his graduate degrees from Brigham Young University. Uh, his research was funded by the um, Department of Energy, and he's held positions in the public and private sectors. Uh, he was a lead consultant on environmental projects and programs uh, throughout both the United States and the Middle East region, which was my big luck. Uh, fortunately, that's where I uh, got to meet him. And. Um, He's held uh, many important offices uh, with the Arizona Voluntary Remediation Program, the Governor of California Floodplain Management Task Force, uh, to, especially after the disasters in Arizona and Hawaii. Um, and of course, he's been on the Dubai Waterways Committee. He's uh, also on the technical committees of the World Future Energy Summit. Uh, the uh, he's been a member of the Crown Prince of Jordan Innovation Board. The list goes on and on. I'm going to need to put on my sunglasses to look at such a brilliant resume. So without further ado, I can't wait to give the microphone to uh, our colleague and uh, man, I'm proud to say my good friend, Dr. Moavier Adaide. Okay, Dr. thank you. I'm humbled by that. Sorry. So what do you, Doctor? All right. Thank you, Dr. Krishna and uh, Dr. Shireen. Thank you very much. I am humbled by that introduction, and it's wonderful uh, to hear uh, your voice, my good friend. And um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, I, um, I appreciate the opportunity. I thank IFES and the GEDC, Dr. Hoyer, Dr. Krishna, Dr. Shireen, and Aliki for this uh, opportunity. And um, what I will do, I will uh, go ahead and, and, and share my screen. Um, and please, Dr. Krishna, just confirm if, uh, yeah, you, if, can if see, you can, can see. see. You just have to put it on full screen more. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So the uh, and I, I really greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak about uh, something that is so relevant and pressing. Um, especially nowadays, in, in these strange times that we are living in. Um, the, uh, the pandemic that we are all going through is, is uh, truly a, a trying thing that uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to uh, 
prevail. We, uh, as, a, as a human race, we are always have proved to be resilient and um, adaptable. And, um, and I think we are, we are managing the situation uh, quite well right now. And going back to some, something that resembles a, a, a normal, and soon, hopefully, things will go back to um, a new normal. And the reason why I say a new normal, because uh, hopefully we have learned uh, a few lessons uh, in, this, in this past year, year and a half, uh, and an opportunity for us all to reflect on uh, these lessons and, and the, the impacts that they've had on, uh, on our lives and the lives of the, the people around us and our community, and also the environment. Um, and in one of the slides, I'm going to touch on, on this uh, as well. But Can my talk today... Screen? Can you click show my screen again? Okay. Is that okay now? Bye. Okay. So one of the things that uh, Dr. Krishna and I have discussed is that uh, we have to learn technology now because we are doing a lot of these web webinars and uh, online meetings and uh, uh, one of the silver linings coming out of, um, of this pandemic, uh, if there are any, is uh, the acceleration of the adoption of many of these technologies. Um, but going back to the uh, why do we develop sustainably and why we should, con we should continue doing that, and why now it's not a luxury anymore, it's a necessity, and why a multidisciplinary approach is needed to uh, develop truly sustainable communities. Starting with the situation that we are in right now, if you look at um, historically um, greenhouse gas emissions and the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, for hundreds of thousands of years, it has hovered under the 300 parts per million. And all of a sudden, when human activity has take, kicked into gear, and, and we've seen, um, especially after World War II and, and a lot of industrial movement and, and building and, and, and also the um, uh, utilization of the fossil fuel uh, as well as agricultural activities and other activities. They've all contributed to the increase of the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere. And it has reached the levels that are quite alarming. We're looking at well over 400 parts per million right now. And if we do nothing about it, we're looking at some quite bleak scenarios. And the impacts of climate change is not only I mean, it's global warming, uh, but at the same time, it has created extremes. And if you look at the last, every year we look at the last 20 years and we say, well, last year broke the records, the last 20 years have been the hardest in the past so many years. And it is becoming a reality that is looking us in the eye. And this global warming or climate change has created extremes. So we've seen conditions of deep freeze in some parts of the world in the winters and winters getting longer and, and shifting. And at the same time, we've seen extreme heat and, and drying and, and, and droughts in, in many parts of the world that have led to some significant events that have increased in the frequency and intensity such as the forest fires that we have seen and the fires that we've seen in Australia and, and in the US and California. And at the same time, the wet areas have been getting much more wet and a lot of flooding that have wreaked havoc on many parts of the world and continue to do so, uh, creating, well, leading to the sad loss of lives and, and, and disrupting economic activity and, and destruction of properties. So this is the situation that we live in and then countries got together and said, what can we do about this? And there has been the Kyoto Protocol, and, and the most significant one was the Paris Agreement. And I'm sure many are um, familiar with it. But the, the, the premise of that, the main goal of that is that countries should pull together. This is, we're talking about multidisciplinary approach to sustainability, but this is a transboundary problem. It's not one country's problem. It is a global, truly global problem everybody has to step in and take part in providing the solution for not only developed countries but all countries and it, it, the goal is to have efforts to limit the temperature rise to one and a half degrees 
with and, and well below the two degrees and uh, the global emissions need to fall to net zero as soon as possible and that developed economies need to reach that goal by 2050. So these are really uh, significant goals and they require action but at the same time we don't have the luxury of time. Um, we need to accelerate the process to reach um, these goals. And, and, and luckily we've seen the U.S. stepping back into the uh, Paris uh, Climate Agreement and, uh, and putting forward some significant targets of 50% by uh, 2030. Uh, and if we look at what would happen if, if we don't do anything, if, if it's business as usual, we risk by 2100 to hit 4.1 degrees Celsius increase. And if we um, set the right goals, we'll meet the one and a half degrees. But there are many national proposals that are put forward that um, to, to reduce the emissions that will still be quite shy of the one and a half degree call, uh, goal. So this, um, these meetings that happen, the conference of parties continue to happen. There should always be a push to um, improve and um, have more ambitious uh, goals so that we can hit the one and a half, hopefully, below the one and a half degrees Celsius. And then there was life before Corona and life during Corona and life after Corona. And we have seen the significant improvement in the air quality and the water quality and, and also the, um, the, the uh, return to health when it comes to wildlife and wildlife coming into our communities as well uh, to, to visit. But um, we've seen firsthand, and that's another silver lining from this um, event that we, we are still going through, is the human impact is true and it is significant. And if we manage to reduce our footprint in so many areas, we will have real impact on improving life on this planet. Then what can we do? Uh, there are things that can be done in all aspects of, uh, of life. And, uh, but if we look at the um, urban communities and uh, we look at the cities and the, and the built environment, um, the built environment and the cities are responsible for about two thirds of the energy consumption and emissions. So if we want to look for the low hanging fruit, then we need to look at the cities and what can we do within the cities? How do we improve things within the cities significantly so that we can have the greatest impact and re reduction um, of the uh, emissions and uh, meeting the, uh, the targets that we have set for ourselves? Um, the problem is that many people are slated to move to these urban communities and mostly towards the coastal areas. People naturally gravitate towards the, the water. But at the same time, this movement to the urban communities and cities will create more uh, pressure on the environment. Um, the buildings within the cities were globally, the buildings are responsible for 40% of the energy consumption and emissions. So we have to do something about the buildings and the built environment. And for example, in the EU, the, the buildings, uh, we have to retrofit and, um, and improve the efficiency and, and the insulation of uh, many of the existing buildings. Now, there are, there are codes for the new buildings, green codes for the new buildings, but we have the existing buildings that uh, need to improve the conditions of. And the goal is to meet the Paris Agreement 250 million homes across the UAE, I'm sorry, the EU, will, the EU will need energy renovation. And that's about 23,000 homes a day. And currently we're going at about 50% of that. So we have to accelerate the process and improve the energy efficiency within these buildings because that has the most impact. And the IEA calls energy efficiency your first fuel. So before tapping into new sources of energy and by improving the energy efficiency of buildings we could reduce the requirements for new energy sources 
So within the built environment, uh, there have been many attempts, the successful ones, to introduce the concept of the sustainable city and the sustainable community or development. There have been ones in the US, the UK, in Denmark, in, in Europe, in Germany, Asia, Japan, and uh, three of those, uh, there are probably more, but three of those are in the UAE. There's uh, the Mustard uh, City, which is supported by the UAE government, and two uh, communities that have been developed by the private sector that I've had the privilege to work um, on. One is the Sustainable City in Dubai, and the other one is the Sharjah Sustainable City. And the um, one is by Diamond Developer, and the other one is a joint venture between Diamond Developer and Show and Sharjah. Now, those communities provide the inspiration for how this movement of development of the uh, uh, habitats for humans should be um, uh, directed. And to be able to develop these sustainable communities, truly sustainable communities, they have to stand on three pillars, the social, environmental, and economic. And I always call that the three-legged stool. If you kick one of the legs, it'll fall. So you can't have truly sustainable community or call something a sustainable city that is only focused on the energy dimension, for example. So it has to look at the social and environmental and economic values. And uh, I will discuss those as well in the next slides, but those have to work together. But to be able to do that, a paradigm has to be adopted, a paradigm of engaging, innovating, and sustaining. So engaging, which means engaging with the local environment, working with nature, um, uh, something that actually uh, will engage the, um, the local community and, and, and the people who are affected by this project and will benefit from this uh, project, um, and also engaging with the culture and heritage and history of the place. So you can't, you can't put a, a foreign object in a place and say, well, this is the new model. It'll be rejected. So this engaging um, element is very important and it differs from one place to another. So engaging, for example, within the environment uh, and uh, looking at the sources of renewable energy is different from one place to another. And the innovation part is something that is quite important that takes place from the concept through the design through the implementation, through the operation. It is very important to continually innovate. This multidisciplinary approach requires that we pull things together, pull different technologies together, different disciplines together, so that we can develop truly sustainable communities. Uh, you have to have the um, social scientists, the environmental scientists, and the economists working together to develop something that would actually work. And then how do you sustain that? We sustain it by um, implementing um, uh, technologies, um, IOTs, um, um, smart meters, uh, AI, all of these are put in place to monitor and, and uh, make sure that the systems are working proper, uh, properly and, and that they're, they're functioning efficiently and continually tweak the different systems in place that relate to energy and water and waste and air quality and so on to make sure that the uh, performance of the, um, the community and that built environment is working very well and improve as we go. It's a living uh, thing. So uh, there are technologies that are put in place and when we come to the operation and maintenance, we might have to change certain systems with newer, more efficient uh, systems. And all of these feed into this sustainable development goals that were set forward by the UN. And each one of the social, environmental, and economic um, elements feed and, and, and provide support to those sustainable uh, development goals. Um, and I will try to uh, mention or highlight some of these um, as we go. So looking at the social sustainability dimension, it is important to build a community that um, caters to the happiness and well-being of its residents. And to be able to, to do that, um, 
it has to be a healthy uh, community it has to have the right education um, systems and, and 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 schools and uh, and also um, it's an opportunity to integrate within these schools um, the right curriculum that brings up the level of knowledge of the students when it comes to sustainability so they learn about energy all the way from kg to 12 and they learn about how to grow their own food they grow, learn about how um, to um, uh, deal with with water and water management and efficiency and how to uh, learn about the circular uh, economy and waste management so all of these things can be now taught at a very early age and there are many schools that are doing a great job and one of them is in the sustainable city in, in dubai which i will be showing some uh, pictures from that uh, great community um, where the um, sustainable curriculum or sustainability is integrated within the curriculum and that needs to carry through universities as well and uh, we are uh, having a, a discussion uh, with IFES and GEDC uh, through this webinar hopefully this will spark some ideas how these multidisciplinary things can um, can be um, can can grow and uh, be further creating spaces and places where people can meet so for the children, for, for the adults, and also functions and, um, and events um, that relate to the, uh, to the culture and, and, and to the arts, um, all not only um, improve the sense of well-being and happiness, but also a sense of belonging to the place, and at the same time, uh, improve the um, accept acceptability of these uh, uh, models. Uh, and will have an impact on the economic dimension as well. So these are pictures of some of the events that have taken place in the sustainable city in, in Dubai. And developing a community that um, provides the opportunities for a leading an active lifestyle has a direct effect and impact on the health and well-being of the residents. This requires that the the architects and, and, and the engineers and, and the, uh, uh, the social scientists all sit together and have a discussion about what really works. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, the sports, uh, sports uh, enthusiasts uh, see, you know, how, what kind of activities are needed and the types of spaces that need to be placed and the types of facilities that need to be built. Um, and we had the opportunity, my family and I, to live in the sustainable city and, and live and breathe sustainability for, for a few years. And it was a wonderful opportunity. And by the way, that's my daughter riding the horse here. So, uh, so it, it, it is a, a wonderful opportunity to live in these communities. And hopefully we'll see more and more of these communities spring up around the world. And another example of the um, social dimension and uh, is, is creating these uh, green open spaces that also benefit from technologies relating to water purification. So, for example, this is a treated sewage effluent uh, pond and the water is polished uh, quite well. That provides an opportunity for people to meet in a park uh, next to the water. And the uh, Online learning that we have um, all uh, gone through with our kids and, and, and families is uh, probably here to stay. But at the same time, there's the outdoor learning uh, dimension, which is uh, proved to be safer during this uh, pandemic. So in the design of um, these communities, um, engineers should look at also how to create these kinds of spaces. Uh, because it provides for a great uh, environment for the kids to learn. And when we discuss the uh, environmental sustainability dimension, so that's on the social dimension, and you could see that there, there is a, a multidisciplinary approach to uh, the sustainable um, uh, element which relates to the social life within a community um, that requires collaboration between um, different disciplines. Uh, when it comes to the environmental sustainability um, dimension, this has uh, to do with the growing food within the community, the energy and the water and the design and products 
and the mobility and the, and the waste management within the communities. So looking at the food um, element within a sustainable city, and these are pictures from the sustainable city in Dubai. How do the uh, designers and architects um, come up with ideas um, that will put forward the opportunity to grow more food within the communities? And this is this is the farm to table uh, concept. This is making sure that um, food security is reached at certain levels within the local community and um, within the um, these smaller communities and propagating to the to the city and the and the country and we have seen the importance of that during this uh, pandemic when there was a lockdown and there was limitations on how much food can flow between countries um, so the the landscape architects and the architects and the engineers have to sit down together and see how they can design uh, trees that provide the shading to reduce the heat island effect, uh, spaces for a community uh, to, to grow urban farming, and that, that has a social uh, dimension as well, where people can meet and discuss and congregate and, and talk about the food, and also an opportunity to um, bring back to health the, the population that has, be, has been decreasing significantly. Also, there are many technologies that relate to growing food. There is indoor farming, and indoor farming has a, a wide spectrum of applications. So there's the aquaponic, hydroponic, and, and aeroponic. And, and at the same time, uh, some of them are climate controlled to a, a low tech level. Others are to a high degree in well insulated um, containers, for example, and um, with lighting and um, cooling or heating systems. And in an, trying out some of these pilots, we realized that it is possible to grow the equivalent of 10 or more times what you would grow in the open field in a contained, controlled environment. And at the same time, the water footprint, the water demand could be as low as 5% of what is needed in the, um, in the open field. And, and these, the produce that comes out of these uh, uh, controlled environments typically would be chemical free and would be more readily available to eat. And at the same time, because it's within the community, the concentration of nutrients is quite high. You could lose up to 25% of the nutrients during the first 24 hours of harvesting. So being able to pick your fruit or leafy produce and immediately take it to the kitchen makes a big difference and has an impact on the health and well-being of the residents. The energy dimension, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the low-hanging fruits of improving or reducing greatly our carbon footprint. And it depends on the area and location that these developments are in. So um, in the UAE, uh, sun is, uh, is in abundance, so PVs make a lot of sense. Not enough wind for wind energy, but uh, in other places it could be a different mix. And that is the engaged part of uh, looking at what works in that certain place uh, or a specific place. So it could be an energy mix in Europe, for example, could be geothermal and wind. Um, biogas works typically everywhere and provides a solution to uh, waste management. But at the same time, the energy engineers have to sit down with the architects and see, okay, well, we, we're gonna have these solar panels or we're gonna have these windmills or we're gonna have uh, you know, different features of energy. But how do we make it more aesthetic and aesthetically pleasing and integrated within the design? So for example, this pergola is essentially the PV panels. Uh, this is the rooftop in the sustainable city in Dubai, which provided an outdoor living uh, space. So the energy solutions could be part of the architectural and design solutions. And that requires the different disciplines to work together. Water management, making sure that the right amount of water, reducing the water significantly, as is the case in the energy, making sure that the, the homes are well insulated and the windows and walls and, 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 and the right paint is applied. And at the same time, the, um, the right um, appliances and material and, and lighting is used within the homes. So that reduces the energy efficiency, uh, sorry, increases the energy efficiency, reduces the amount of PVs needed. Um, so that they can fit 
uh, on a limited space like a rooftop. The same applies to the water. Um, so the right fixtures can reduce the, the water demand within a community by up to 50 or more percent. And then all of that water that comes out needs to be treated. So that requires collaboration between the civil engineer and the chemical engineer, and wastewater treatment plant operators to make sure that the water is within the um, levels in terms of quality that are acceptable for um, irrigating um, the green spaces within the uh, community and um, of a quality that would be also applicable for some of the productive landscaping. Um, and also within the landscaping, making sure that the right types of plants that have a lower water demand, so that requires an agricultural engineer collaborating with the water engineer and the landscape architect. And the, the goal is to, um, within the water uh, element, to conserve, recycle, but also harvest. There are technologies right now um, that enable us to harvest humidity from the air. And these are contained um, elements. They have the, the solar within them, and they have the pumps and the, uh, the filters, and they provide clean drinking water. And that will make a big difference for rural areas in different parts of the world where waterborne diseases are um, a major uh, problem. We look at design and material, and that's where design, designers and material engineers can also pull together and work on solutions. In the design side, um, so making sure that the homes um, have what is called the passive design. So in, in this part of the world, in the UAE, and the, the Middle East, and the Gulf region, uh, we try to avoid the sun. So we have our homes facing in a, in a different direction, uh, facing north instead of south, so that we can have less of the um, uh, sun coming into the homes. While in Europe, for example, you want to do the reverse so that you get more of the um, sunlight and, and the uh, warming. And uh, effect. The um, precast and modular construction movement is propagating uh, across the world and it has great value because it reduces the waste during construction, it's very efficient, and the construction process has um, is a stressor to the environment. So um, reducing the, the duration of construction and also um, the economic dimension to it is, is quite great. So because they're modular and they're ready, they're typically more economically feasible. And as I mentioned before, um, we have to make sure that the, the proper appliances and, and, and cooling and heating systems and lighting are in place to reduce the energy and requirements as well as the right products for uh, water uh, textures. Um, so all of these uh, things pulled together and integrated within the design um, will produce the, the right type of home um, with the right efficiency and at the right uh, price. So the goal here is to create these communities that are resilient, that are smart, and that are efficient and have the right return on investment. If it doesn't have that uh, dimension, then it will not be um, repeated. And all of those will produce a truly sustainable community. When it comes to the mobility, uh, we have four or five more slides. Uh, the mobility um, element, there is, there is a revolution right now globally when it comes to clean mobility, the electrification of uh, vehicles and fleets, uh, and also turning the cities into more walkable, uh, cyclable, cities. Uh, the picture on the right here is in the Netherlands. They have uh, bicycle highways and it, it is important to make sure that in the design of cities that um, the transportation engineers work with the, um, uh, the urban planners to make sure that these things can be uh, put in place. Um, so, And that will have a, a major impact also on the health and well-being of the residents of uh, these cities making sure that the right infrastructure is in place when it comes to uh, charging stations uh, will be quite helpful in uh, increasing the number of electric vehicles on the streets. 
um, autonomous vehicles are becoming a reality. Um, the sustainable city in Dubai has piloted uh, one quite successfully. Uh, drone delivery is also becoming a reality. And then there's the car sharing and car sharing apps that are widely uh, spread and used. Uh, there is a, a level of apprehension right now because of the, the pandemic of people coming back together and sharing a car or sharing an office. Uh, but I think once we're over that, we'll go back uh, to the car sharing and probably the office sharing because it does make great economic sense and has a significant um, reduction on our uh, carbon footprint. Um, companies, uh, all um, automobile companies, uh, auto manufacturers are moving towards electrification of their cars. One company is, has announced um, that they will have three new EVs or EV models by 2025. So it's becoming a reality pretty soon. It will not be just the Tesla, it'll be all cars, all car models that have electric vehicles. Having the right infrastructure in place for waste segregation within the home and the community um, is, is key for the success of any uh, waste management program. Uh, the reuse of the construction material, uh, the composting within the community, and there are many, the composting goes from simple all the way to high tech, uh, but also using the right uh, material uh, during the construction to reduce construction waste, which is a, a significant contributor to the landfills. All of these put in place will be uh, a wonderful uh, contributor to the circular economy. Um, and, and that has been applied in many communities and many cities quite successfully. And in, including and engaging the kids in that process is, uh, is key. As, as I mentioned, when I talk about the schools and integrating these programs into, within the cu curriculum, it is important also to have it within the community and have the kids engaged in it. And they grow uh, with that becoming part of their life. Uh, they would no longer think of, of it as the previous generation of, okay, well, um, it, is, it is a burden to do this, but it will be, it'll just come naturally to them. And finally, the economic sustainability, uh, the green economy, is a reality and the green economy is going to create what is uh, slated to to be trillions of dollars of uh, in opportunities um, in 2019 according to irena 11 and a half million jobs were created in the renewable energy alone so there are many jobs being created in the circular economy in in the uh, clean water sector in the air quality sector and and so on and all of these are part of the this green uh, economy and material engineering as well. And this helps create resilient uh, communities when it comes, comes to creating jobs and being able to, to grow. Uh, sustainable communities have proved to, uh, to be um, uh, crisis resilient. Uh, they, they provide a lower um, running cost when your energy bill and your water bill is significantly lower and energy could be um, down to zero when, when you have these beautiful sunny days for example providing all the energy that you need uh, so that um, has uh, people warming up to, to to adopting more sustainable lifestyle and living within sustainable communities and finally sustainability goes hand in hand with the shared um, value creation and creating the shared value uh, is um, having the uh, this competitiveness uh, between companies and the health of communities as uh, something that is uh, of the past because that goes hand in hand when when the the suppliers and the customers uh, and and uh, and the employees and consumers are all working together together to create these um, the values, uh, for example, the green economy is a great example of that. Government stepping in with the proper regulatory framework to enable uh, and grow uh, the, the green economy. All of that will have a great impact on, on the environment, reducing our carbon footprint and getting us inching closer, hopefully not inching, but leaping forward to, uh, towards meeting the, uh, the goals um, that have been set and, and agreed to um, 
such as the Paris Agreement, and making sure that living a sustainable lifestyle becomes the norm, and um, and, and we reap the benefits uh, out of it. Um, I look forward to the questions. Uh, I will stop at this. Okay, great, uh, Dr. Tarade, the fantastic presentation. Uh, let's uh, uh, open it up. We have uh, a few people that I have you know, uh, put on the panel to make some comments if they wish to. No pressure. Uh, I have uh, we have uh, you know, almost 60 participants who can also chat if they if they wish. So I look forward to you know, chat messages coming in. So we have some time for that. Uh, you did have a couple of polls. Was that your was that what was your polls that you wanted to put on? Sure. I don't know if that, yes, please. I'll put them on very quickly just to get people a little bit uh, energized. I'm going to quickly put in the, uh, uh, the poll. Uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, what part of the world are you joining from? Please select one. Uh, so let's just take a minute to do that. So let's see what that is. Yeah, Africa, Asia Pacific, Australia, Europe, the Americas. Um, I'll give you a few more seconds. About half the people have voted. Uh, a few more will vote in just a minute. If I could come in. Uh... Yeah, First off, thank you so very much, Dr. Mavier. It was wonderful as usual. I'll save my questions till later. I just want to say, had it been earlier today, I would have had to say Asia. And mm -hmm. since I am visiting my mom now in Istanbul, now I have to say Europe. Europe. Because my, my home <laughs> in Istanbul is on the Asian side, but mom lives on the European side, which is only half an hour away. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll. It's uh, and share. Uh, it says uh, Africa 4%, Asia 69%, Europe 15%, America's uh, 12%. Okay, and uh, I'm going to hide that and very quickly uh, go to the next poll. In your in your opinion, uh, which field is lagging behind uh, our journey? So, uh, in terms, uh, is it farming, transportation, energy, products, slash waste, or water? Which field is lagging behind in our journey? Sustainable uh, future. Okay, it's coming in. Responses are coming in. Uh, okay, so we have uh, great. So we have uh, okay. So a uh, few more seconds, folks. Hurry up. Okay, so I'm going to close and share so we can have time for questions. It says. Um, but 46% in, in products and waste, 25% water, 13% energy, 13% transportation, 4% farming. So then I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to hide and uh, I'm going to come have some un, un, unmute some of the panelists. I think uh, uh, Michael, you are, are you able to speak? You unmuted yourself, I think. Yes. Right? I think, can you hear me? Okay, come in, Michael. Yeah. You can hear me. Okay. Yeah. yeah hey, I listen, I. I I just wanted to thank you very much for doing this. I think this is like I, this is this is the issue of our time, and I, I think you know we we have really good you know technical solutions. We have things that we can do, but it's the sense of urgency. I I was invited to give a, a, a talk at a commencement this past year, just a couple of months ago, and one of the th one of the facts that I recover I discovered was I graduated from, with my bachelor's degree in 1983, and since that time. The world population's increased 62 percent. That's that's a huge number, and I don't, you know, I, I I don't know how the planet sustains this continued growth. I mean, I just, I, I it's not possible. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to um, argue anything to dealing with, you know, human reproduction or anything like that. It's just I think this is this is the this is the the the, the issue that's really got to push us more dramatically because. Uh, Again, we're get, we're getting to the point of no return, and um, I mean, we you you mentioned in your opening talk all the the natural disasters. It's only going to get worse and worse, and it's going to get worse and worse a lot faster than I think people even anticipate. So, again, I think it's this it's this how do we how do we strategize to create the sense of urgency amongst governments, industry, you know that that's the big challenge I really think. Not so much on the technical side. Yes. I, I agree with you, uh, Michael. Can I can I just uh, yeah, yeah. follow up to that uh, that point? Uh, creating a unified sense of urgency has always been the challenge. I mean, uh, you got people on on uh, both sides, and, uh, and 
they politicize a process or a reality that we're actually seeing with our own two eyes. How do you bring them um, into the process? Is, there, there is no one solution. Is there are people driven by the economics of it, people driven by the social values, and, and people are driven strictly by the environmental um, uh, elements. I think you got to speak to the minds of, and hearts uh, across all aisles uh, to make sure that the message is, is received and received well, and at the same time that people see that there's a benefit to, um, to all of them, to different walks of life and, and, and different uh, places. Uh, knowledge sharing is, is very important, sharing the um, information from trusted sources, uh, putting it out there in the right format is, is quite important, and giving the proper coverage uh, to um, events that um, take place and success stories as, as well. We, we don't hear a lot of success stories. We only hear doom and gloom here and there. But there are great success stories, and, and I've shared with you a few of those today. Um, will will all help, uh, but you gotta you gotta work on the the three dimensions: the social, environmental, and economic. It cannot be only economic or socially driven. Um, and and it took us 200,000 years to reach a billion, Michael, and, and maybe 200 to reach seven. Uh, we're slated to hit 10 soon. So. Uh, the, the carrying capacity of the planet is, is almost reached, but at the same time, through innovation uh, and, uh, and creativity, we'll always find a, a way uh, to, to reduce our carbon footprint, and it's happening. It's becoming a reality. The technologies are already here. We just need okay, to put them into action. Ramiro, you want to come in? Ramiro, Allah? Yes, I just want to follow up on uh, what Michael said, the sense of urgency. Uh, my question is, we need to land this at the personal level. You know, we can't just depend on the governments, the industry. How do, how do we, I start this at home? This is what the message is missing. Uh, your case is a, it's a great case. I mean, I work with in poor countries and climate or they don't see this. It's about survival. And the, and the point of no, no return is what scares me. There was a call action by all the noble large scientific scientists over a month ago we are in the point of no return or we're going to hit the point of no return and we already have since the 70s eliminated 68 percent of the biodiversity of the planet so i just echo want to echo michael's call i mean how do we land this to at the individual level to make a difference because that's all thank you Great presentation, really great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've got a couple of uh, the questions from the audience. I'm going to read them out. And uh, uh, Johannes van uh, Nijkerk, I believe a first step to sustainability is to manage uh, and constrain the demands and expectations of the community that lives in the sustainable cities. Uh, do you agree? And how can one manage these expectations when developing a new city? Uh, were you able to do so in the projects you were involved? Well, uh, you, you can't uh, overpromise. You you gotta have your head in the clouds and your feet on the ground. So um, it's very important that, um, and I and this by the way follows up to uh, Ramiro's point. Uh, how do we make sure that the message is clear uh, and and public awareness is very important. And when it comes to a, a project, there should be public awareness at the level of that project that this is this is what this project does this is what you expect to achieve and this is where all of these systems that we put in place will not work if you don't step in and switch off the AC in the rooms that you don't use and and, and make sure that your you know your water consumption is reasonable so you could put the best systems in place but if they're not used properly then that negates the the purpose so those expectations and this frank and open discussion should take place in community discussions with the residents and also spreading the awareness among the residents. At the same time, those thresholds or metrics should be shared with them that if you do this, you will have a zero electricity bill in the summer. But if you don't do that, 
then we're not, you know, we're not lying to you. This is not, uh, you know, uh, trying to trick you to live in a community. But these communities perform in a certain way when everybody pulls together and, and do things in a certain manner. And this, by the way, you, you can expand that on a city and a country and a global level. Uh, our resources are limited, uh, so we have to Question. manage them well. Question from a young student, engineering student from India. It says, where do we start to get students, engineering students, to get more involved with sustainable cities? Where do we start? <laughs> I am so happy he asked this question, or she. Uh, this is the, the, the main premise of this discussion today, Dr. Krishna, is the students oh. are graduating. <laughs> Yeah. So the students that are graduating and coming into the workforce, many of them are specialists. You know, he or she is an electrical engineer. But if they want to come and work in, in developing this sustainable future, they have to understand how things work together. So there has to be within the curriculum subjects that will improve the, the knowledge of uh, an energy engineer about water systems and about uh, you know indoor farming and uh, at the same time how they can come up with with designs that will be will appeal to the to the end users um, when it comes to the built environment and i showed that example of a pergola but that's a very simple example and then there's a social uh, dimension you can't come up with solutions without really understanding the um, social um, value and the impact that they, they would have on the um, the life of the people who will be, end up using these technologies. So I think new subjects have to come into the the mainstreams that borrow from the outside, from other disciplines, and the students have a certain level of knowledge. So what we've done with our interns, for example, is that we ran them through a rotational program where they've learned about the food, the energy, the water, the products, the mobility, waste, air quality, and also the social dimension, and learned about the economics, so that eventually can talk about sustainability in an intellectual way. So yes, we need the specialists, but we need those specialists to also understand what are those other disciplines. It could be a course from those different departments that is interjected within their degree that will enable the students to have a leg up or a head start when they come into the market. So this is from the education si side. Where do we start on the education side? Where do we start on other things? That are, that's a long discussion as well. Okay, question from Chandan uh, Pramanik. That's, uh, this issue needs to be looked through a different lens uh, between a developed nation and a developing nation as the contribution of each of the developed nations to current state may be different from a developing country. What are your thoughts on that? Very true. So it, it, it is not a one size fits all. So you cannot do um, a sustainable community in, a, in, in, in Europe and, and say, well, I want to do this everywhere. So if you remember the engage element that I've mentioned in the paradigm, so you have to look at the location where that community will be built. So the type of material that will be used in the construction will be different. The energy mix and the economics of that energy mix will be different. So there's a lot of innovation that has to happen, uh, that has to happen depending on where you want to build that community. The design will be different. But the, the concept of a sustainable community, the uh, economic feasibility of it, the applicability of it is something that can, can happen um, Anywhere. You okay, be, wait, I, I need to get hand this back to Hans and Serene. So, uh, Hans, back over to you. Uh, uh, thank a couple you, of questions, thank but you. there's no time, unfortunately. Yeah, go ahead, Hans. Yeah. You want to you wanna raise one more question from the audience, Krishna? Uh, this is from Alfredo Sorero. Uh, so, 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 he's a good friend of ours. How can we upskill active engineers, <laughs> active engineers to have the right competences to handle the selling challenge? Yeah, the, one of the biggest challenges that uh, we face is that the, uh, especially the expert engineers, 
um, it's challenging, you know, an engineer with 20, 25 years of experience. Uh, how do you how do you get through to him that look there are other things that you need to learn? And I uh, learning and uh, we all agree to this that that doesn't stop. You should accept always that there are evolving and emerging technologies and 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 things that are coming together now that you need to learn about. Uh, when it comes to engineer, it's um, you employability. You, uh, you have more opportunities when you um, when you have greater knowledge and wider knowledge about the disciplines of sustainability and being a specialist in, in a field. But at the same time, you can understand and help design and help provide solutions uh, that make sense to sustainability. Okay, Hans. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Radeka. You have given us. From my perspective, and I'm working very closely with uh, Krishna for the last three years, this is one of the most important and creative presentations. And not only in terms of the intellectual content, but also the visibility of what you uh, presented to us. I'm personally very, very, uh, very, very, very impressed per se. And also some of your, for, for example, a key comment, creating a unified sense of urgency. And that parallels and reinforces the important comments made by, by Ramiro as well as Michael Milligan and so forth. I just wanted to, to mention that. I very much want to get back to you and, and think about doing a, a, second, a second part of, of this presentation moving forward. We don't need to get into that. And I'm going to introduce you also today to our current IFES president, Ala Ashmabi, who is in Dubai. And he, uh, I know, will find it very, very important to meet you and for he, both. He is here. He is here, by the way. He might want to say oh. hello. Well, if he is, let, him, let, me, let me just finish a couple of comments here. But Allah, please speak. If, if you are here, I'm very, very happy. Let me just say for, just for many of the participants here, the whole question of the student participation is fundamental to the culture of IFES primarily, where we have student organizations and also the GDC. And we are preparing, and I want to put that seed into our agenda, our conference this November in Madrid will be high. It'll be virtual, where we will have students, faculty, certainly corporate colleagues, deans, and so forth pre present of that. And I really want to encourage you to put this and get in touch with us, put this on your agendas so that you can uh, uh, be with us. Also, before that, in Germany, we will have our GDC Industry Forum in September. But the broader audience that brings in particularly students and so forth is in Madrid. And I really Want, to, want you to think about it, be in touch in, in, in touch with us. So with, with those comments, Radija, I'll be in touch with you. Very, very thoughtful. Krishna, please. Yeah, Allah, come in. Thank you all so much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Radija, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure. I just want to echo what all our colleagues uh, said earlier regarding the urgency of this issue and uh, I want to uh, also highlight what you mentioned regarding creating a value proposition uh, and a value system around around the issue, and that's the way forward. And I look forward to, to talking with you in more detail. I look forward to it, Dr. Ala. Please uh, reach out uh, and, and provide me with your contact information. I'll be happy to reach out. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Dr. Tadade, and uh, thank you everybody who has been. Uh, actively participating in this uh, webinar and everybody stay happy stay uh, healthy stay safe Sirin, you want to say anything at the end i just want to echo what everybody else has said and thank you so much again dr mavier for this very uh, inclusive expansive interdisciplinary presentation which is exactly what we need uh, we tend to view most of the sustainable development goals as engineering problems, which they of course are. Uh, but then again, uh, the socio-economic and environmental sustainability requires a lens like you have presented today. And I'm only going to say, um, look forward to your participation and contribution to the GEDC community in the name of the engineering, um, the global engineering academic community. So thank you so very much and see you at our next event. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you Dr. Srin, Dr. Hoyer, Dr. Krishna.
Bye bye. Peace be with you. Stay healthy. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye everyone.